Welcome to the Parish Art Museum podcast, where we aspire to provide opportunities for learning, sharing, and celebrating the many innovative and pioneering artists who call the East End home. Come back each week to find new and impactful experiences in the arts. Hi, everybody. Nice to see you tonight. I'm Terry Sultan. I'm the director here at the parish, for those of you who I may not have met yet. We're going to have a great night tonight. I'm really, really excited about our film and our speakers. So our producer, director, all-around maker is Dennis Scholl, who is an award-winning documentary film director and producer and writer. And uh, his projects include The Last Resort, which won Best Feature Documentary at the Miami Jewish Film Festival in 2018, Singular, that also won a Best Feature Documentary at the Haiti International Film Festival in 2019, and Lifeline, Clifford Still, which had its world premiere at Doc New York City in 2019. And that's what we're going to see tonight, and we're very excited about that. Queen of Thursdays. Well, you get a lot of awards, Dennis, but Best Feature Documentary at the Miami International Film Festival in 2016, Deep City, Birth of the Miami Sound in 2014. As a matter of fact, he has received 13 regional Emmys for his work on public television, including Everyone Has a Place, with Wynton Marsalis, uh, which has been screened more than 6,500 times on public television stations across the US. Now he's working on a documentary about the pinup photographer and model Bunny Yeager and Gay F Jay Fletcher, America's greatest teacher of blind tasting wines. So we might have to do a lot of film screenings for you, Dennis, and we're going to have a great talk. And our other featured speaker is Deborah Buck, who is an artist, a painter, and who says that painting informs everything she does. Uh, but I think there's a lot more going on there. She does credit her early artistic and intellectual development to her encounters with the legendary abstract expressionist painter Clifford Still, who mentored her as a young artist and sponsored her residency at the Skowhegan School of Art in Painting and Sculpture. So she'll have a lot of very, very interesting and maybe a little dishy um, uh, information on Mr. Still, just to give you a heads up. Deborah graduated from uh, Trinity College in Hartford, and then she moved to New York City, immediately launched into the art uh, world here, worked with the Bronx Museum on a project, and then in addition to her studio practice, which continues to today, she opened Buck House, a gallery on Madison Avenue, which became a kind of a salon for art and design, where people came and talked and were uh, inspired. And during that time, she published books, designed a line of fabrics and wallpapers that were based on her own paintings. So she's very entrepreneurial. She came out here to our community in 2012. She's been living and working in Sagaponic uh, for all that time. I've had the honor to go to her studio quite a few times. Deborah, in 2018, created the Deborah Buck Foundation which is dedicated to supporting fine arts institutions who are actively fighting to reverse the marginalization of women in the arts. She's really doing her bit to, uh, to make sure that diversification is a real thing and not something that just people say. So I know we're gonna have a great conversation. Thank you and enjoy. Okay, that was, uh, that was really a stunning film, congratulations. Thank you. Like everybody else that you interviewed, I have my own Clifford Still story, and I know you have a great one. I moved to San Francisco from Apia, Western Samoa in 1979, and one of the first things I did was go to the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, and I walked in and I saw his paintings for the very first time, and I was just absolutely stunned. And like Neil Bernesra, it started making me think about what it might be like to be able to be in a profession where you could actually work with that kind of material. But he always was a real mystery to me. You know, and even though I studied him in art history classes and spent a lot of time work looking at the work, I have to say that, that your film really humanized him and also showed you know, really both sides of this very, very complicated and enigmatic figure. How did you choose him as a subject? Kind of the same way you did. I never went to a museum growing up. And when I was 22 years old, I went to the Met for the first time. And I walked in that room. Everybody's been to that room. And I was just gobsmacked. I didn't, didn't understand, for, for sure. But it was very moving to me. And he's always been my favorite artist. And you know, I started making movies. And people said, what do you, who do you want to make a movie about? And I said, Clifford Still. When did you start this project? About five years ago, five and a half years ago. It takes a long time to make these movies. And they're put together with like chicken wire and bubble gum. You know, there's no <laughs> real money to make a movie like this. So you just kind of do it when you can do it. And you, 
get your friends involved, like Mark Bradford and Julie and you know people like that, and to, to to help you. And and yeah, it's 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 just a really important personal film, you know, to me. So. I thought it was especially especially touching and nice that you interviewed so many artists who were touched by his work and influenced by his work. I was surprised by that. I didn't, you know, you don't think of Mark Bradford as a guy who's thinking about still, but Mark came to me and he said, I heard you're making this film. And I I know Mark, I've Mm -hmm. owned his work. And he said, let me tell you what I think. He said, you know what I love about still? I didn't get this on camera, it kills me. (laughs) So you know what I love about still? He's not afraid of black. Mm -hmm. So that was, you know, it was was one of those those moments. How, uh, why did you start with the auction? Because I think that the, the biggest problem we will have with the film is, yeah, y'all are the cognoscenti. I mean, y'all know what's up. Everybody's been to this museum many times, and, you know, I kind of feel the spirit of Pollock here tonight because, of, you know, being in the springs and all that. But, but to the average person, how do you contextualize Clifford Still? Mm. There's no work really to see, except now that the museum's open. How do you make him matter in the greater world to people? And, you know, unfortunately, sometimes it's about money. And uh, when you put up on the screen that this guy sold a painting for $62 million, people go, oh, maybe that guy is somebody. Yeah. It's the only way, really, to contextualize you know, him in our society. And it's not my favorite way, frankly, and it's not, I don't love having to open the film that way. But you know, showing him on the prairies of Alberta wasn't going to do anything <laughs> for anybody. You know? so, so that was why we, we, we chose to open that way. Plus, you know, watching Tobias hammer down that, that still is like, it builds a lot of fun tension in yeah. the early yeah. part of the film. Deborah, you, um, you were mentored by, by Clifford Still. How did you meet him? Let's see. I uh, grew up outside of Baltimore, and uh, my dad had become a farmer. And uh, still went to the local dentist, who happened to be very good friends with my parents. And they became very close. The dentist was very sort of uh, enamored of of artwork and very intellectual. And so they sort of hit it off. Then they all learned that Still was having breakfast every morning at the same farmer's restaurant where my father had breakfast every morning. And they (coughs) struck up sort of a a gentleman's friendship where they kind of both gave one another their space. Mm-hmm. No one knew that who Clifford still was or who this very tall man was who'd come with his wife every day. And, uh, but my father did. And anyway, long story short, my father introduced himself to Still. And he said, uh, Mr. Still, I'm David Jones, and you're responsible for my being dragged to Buffalo this weekend by my wife, <laughs> who was a, a culture vulture. And I'm really glad she did. And wow. And then they realized that they both uh, had been pitchers um, and ca- or catchers on farm teams um, in base- with baseball. So then they had this baseball thing. And anyway, they, they really had a sort of a, you know, kind of a wonderful relationship. One day my father says, I've got this daughter. She's an artist. Would you talk to her? Would that you was her? bold. Right. Yeah. That was bold, right? <laughs> yeah. He didn't really, he didn't really, you wouldn't have let him do that if you knew he was going to do it. Because right, nobody cleans stills brushes, right? Um, and uh, anyway, so How old he were you? said, I was in my senior year in high school. Mm. Wow. And, uh-huh, and uh, he said, I'd like to meet her. So we met, and I wrote him a thank you note afterwards. I was, I, I mean, I could go on about like meeting him. And I, he was just like being in the presence of a great wizard to me. Mm. And he was very quiet, and he would sit, and he stirred his coffee. And Mrs. Still and I sort of, you know, made small talk. And he stirred his coffee, and put down his spoon, and he began to talk. Mm. And he talked, and he talked, and he talked. They killed Rothko and (laughs) Clement Greenberg, right? Anyway, and, you know, I was really young, but I just sort of sat there. I knew I was in the presence of something great. Mm-hmm. But also, there was no internet. I had seen his pictures in books. My parents had told me, this is a great artist. I read, and, I, and so I knew, you know, that he was very... So, but I was very awestruck by this man and his story. And he was just so articulate. And I remember being riveted to my chair, just thinking, I have to remember every second of this. So I wrote him this note, and I told him how, you know, uh, how much I would treasure meeting him. And he asked if he could see me again. I showed him my work on the first time, and you know, and um, not many high school students get to yeah, show an artist like your senior <laughs> high school work. <laughs> I mean, when I think about what I'm showing, Clifford Still. So you got from your father that same bold attitude of going for it. I, yeah, yeah, maybe. Yeah, I think my mother gave me a little bit of that too. <laughs> but anyway, and so. 
we met for a few times, and then he was awarded the uh, Skowhegan Prize, and you send someone in your name uh, on a scholarship, and so he wanted to send me. He spoke to me a great deal about what I needed to know about the art world. Mm. <laughs> well, um, but that was an interesting uh, education. And, you know, he told me, I like what I see. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm like, my portfolio is ridiculous. <laughs> but, you know, I really got him. I got, I got how important it was because I had come out of the egg knowing that I needed to make art. Mm. And that's what I was here to do. And I took it very, very, very seriously. So... Anyway, and then we met after Skowhegan, and I think, you know, I, I, he was pleased that I thought there were a lot of people in art school who were trying to learn to live as an artist rather than to make art, mm. and mm -hmm. um, he liked that. <laughs> and I don't, you know, so the last time I saw him was at the Metropolitan Museum, the opening that mm. was in the film. So. Did, did you have a chance to meet him? Oh, no. No. No, I, I um, it was just, I got into his work. You know, and, and, and I, I make films about art and artists. Pretty much everything I've made is about some kind of artistic or cultural endeavor and an artist. And as, being an art collector, I always say I collect art. I don't collect artists. And, mm. you know, we try in every one of the films to make the art one of the principles in the film. And that's what we've tried to do here is to give people kind of the feeling of grandeur, of the feeling of, of kind of, amazement that you have when you stand in front of these paintings and they just envelop you. Mm -hmm. So we try to focus on that too. It's interesting to hear uh, uh, Deborah talk about him talking because the thing that really made the film happen is we found these 34 hours of audio tape of yeah. him you know, in, in Maryland and they, they didn't really know they had him. They had the whole archive. But uh, Dean Sobel, who's a good friend of mine who used to run the Aspen Art Museum and, and basically built and is still operating the Clifford Still Museum, he called me one day and he says, you're not going to believe what we found. I said, oh, you found some video footage. He goes, well, we did. And they did. They had the 28 minutes of video. But he said, we found 34 hours of audio footage. And, you know, and it's, it's him, like he would talk to you, kind of pontificate, you know, speaks in a very stentorian voice. And it's like the voice of God, like his daughter said. So that was an amazing moment for the film because, because then we knew that we could actually have him speak from the grave. And if we didn't get that, his daughter channels him so amazingly. It sounds like it's him. Yeah. So that she was Sandra. I, I sent Sandra the film about ten days ago, and she's brutal about her father. I mean, she just <laughs> she's very specific about how it all is supposed to be. And I was terrified that she was going to hate the film, but you know. But she sent me a really nice note, and she's happy. So <laughs> I'm more relieved than anything else because you, you know you people put their trust in you. You know, I, the whole family cooperated with me. The museum cooperated with me. But you still got to make your film, and this was the film that I wanted to make, the idea of his integrity. You know, this is a guy who got up every morning and wasn't going to change his life to, and give up his integrity. You know, when I spoke to Jeffrey about it, that's the thing that came through in speaking to Jeffrey Laurie about it. It's the same thing. Is you, you felt like he, he was going to do what he had to do to make the art he needed to make, and if he wasn't going to sell work except for once in a while to get a new Jaguar and, you know, feed his family, that was it. And he was okay with that. Mm -hmm. And many artists are not, as, as Deborah said. Many artists are not. Well, I would imagine that there was, there was a lot of tension in his life that way. It's hard to maintain that level of truth to your own core values when everyone around you, like his frenemy, Mark Rothko, that's such a great word. I'm sure that it didn't exist in those days, but it turns out to be kind of true. That they all, t to his mind at least, were compromising their integrity. To his mind. To his mind. You know, he, he had a very specific, rigorous code, and he stuck to that code, you know, uh, throughout his entire life. Gave up an unbelievable number of things, opportunities. I mean, uh, you saw, you know, he could have easily sold one painting and put all those works in storage for 20, 30, 40 years, mm. but he wouldn't, didn't want to sell the one painting. The really cool thing is toward the end of the film, you see a series of paintings side by side that look very similar, but not the same. As uh, Sandra said, he would sell a painting and go, oh, I can't believe I sold that painting. <laughs> He'd take the little watercolor sketch that Patricia would make, and then he would replicate the painting, and that's what they call them. They call them the replicas. And uh, <laughs> so they had a show at, at, at the museum about three years ago. Uh, I went to see it. It's amazing. I mean, they're, they're just, they're not the same, but they're, they look yeah. pretty close. So at the museum, they have a lot of material to work with, and I notice that they're obviously doing some conservation as they're going along. You know, you can't keep paintings rolled up in a studio like that, you know, in a non 
climate-controlled environment and expect everything is going to be great. Uh, how do they work with the material? Do they reinstall the entire museum you know, every few years, or you know, what do they do there? So when you're hearing Maria Callas there, uh, as they were unrolling mm -hmm. the, uh, the paintings, those are paintings that were rolled up in 1970 and were only being unrolled that day for the very first time. It was 2000, I think, 17 or mm. something like that. So, and a lot of the paintings are in remarkably good shape. I, I would say the vast majority of them are in remarkably good shape. Huh. But some of them are not, and you know, they, they, James, the guy who you saw there, he just bangs away on one every day. And, uh, <laughs> it's like painting the Golden Gate Bridge, right? Yeah, like you know, lifetime. when he gets to the end, trust me, yeah. And the other thing they found is that the inventory is much bigger than they thought. There's 830 paintings mm. and about 2,000 drawings. Wow. And there are very few, if any, drawings in circulation, as, you know, in terms of trading hands. And, and then, yeah, Dean has a regular exhibition schedule. He has artists come in. He's had uh, Julian's come in and hung a show. Mark's come in and hung a show. Mm -hmm. Ronnie Horn has come in and hung a show oh, of the work. Uh -huh. And so it's a regular schedule of very interesting things. Mm -hmm. The early part, when you go into the museum, the early years, remains pretty static. Mm -hmm. But there was a show just recently of Clifford Still at Yaddo. You know, so, so, so there are things like that. <laughs> so you can do all kinds of stuff. Yeah. I, I, Dean and, and the staff, which is a really wonderful staff, they show no sign of running out of kind of gas. Mm -hmm. You know, And as you saw at the end of the film, they, they went to court and were able to litigate the idea of sending 10 paintings on tour for the mm -hmm. ABEX show. Mm -hmm. So you know, everybody's starting to read the will a little differently. You know, time. That's what, like what Jerry Salt Mr. said. Mr. Barnes's right. museum, Dr. Barnes's museum, right. yep. you know, I mean, you know, you, know you, you can try as your hardest to make things for posterity, but, you know, as Jerry says, uh, time, time changes, time changes yeah. things. So. so did you ever get a chance, did you go to his studio or did you always meet somewhere? Well, I was going to say, I actually saw all of those paintings in the attic of his house really? after Mr. Still had died. And it's so funny, there were so many things in your film. You, like, I still call him Mr. Still because you called him Mr. Still and Patricia Still called him Mr. Still. So that's, you know, and <laughs> in my mind, he's Mr. Still. But anyway, yeah, I saw all of those paintings up in the attic. It was a very hot day in August after he died in June. Mm. And um, so I was there and I went and had lemonade and, you know. And anyway, and Mrs. Still took me up to see all of the paintings. And I will never forget the smell mm. of the, the linseed oil and the it, in these paintings rolled up. No, no one got to go to his studio. I mean, very, very few people got to go to his studio. He liked to meet at this restaurant, mm -hmm. Bloggers. So Bloggers he, Farmer's Restaurant. Right? Bloggers? Bloggers. Oh. <laughs> mm -hmm. And he, would hold, he held court there mm -hmm. with Mrs. Still and me. He'd roll up in a big silver Lincoln. Yeah. And Dude liked his cars, man. He Dude liked his cars. He really liked his cars. And yeah. it was like, there was like the French Connection Lincoln. And mm -hmm. He liked the big front end, I think. Anyway, yeah, so, and their house was so Spartan and so minimal. And those tubes that, that you show were actually still up in the attic. And I remember there was this big, you know, push to get Mrs. Still to get them at least out of the attic where they were baking mm. and then bring yeah. them down into the yeah. house. But I was going to say that I think one of the most marvelous gifts about all of this, about the museum, about your film, um, is that for so long, you know, I would say, well, you know, Clifford Still mentored me. And people would say, oh, that's nice. Huh, that must have been cool. Now he's sort of coming back to life. And it is a remarkable, it's a, really an extraordinary thing for me as an artist, but I think for the art world to see this man who archived everything. Mm. There, when we discovered that all of my letters that I had written to uh, Mr. Still, to Mrs. Still, were in an, the archive. Mm. They had been given with the yeah, estate. I remember when you found out about that. Right? Yeah. And, and he had also documented all of his letters to me. That's amazing that them. he kept all that. Right? So I think that we can begin to you know, share him again with the world through this incredible archive, through the work that they're doing at the Clifford Still Museum. And the one thing that, that really always comes back to me is he got what he wanted. Mm -hmm. Finally. Yep. Damn, That's if he true. didn't get what he wanted, mm -hmm. you know? And he knew it, he had a vision, he never ever strayed from his vision, and he got it. One of the funniest moments that didn't make the film actually, but we were in the Royal Academy for the exhibition, and Ben Heller shows up, who owns Blue Pole, owns mm -hmm. Blue Poles, and he said, 
whoever calls their husband Mr. Still, you know. <laughs> well, in the old days, they did. <laughs> <coughs> his work but she also really hurt him you know because she had paralysis by analysis she was so afraid of doing something even after he'd passed mm -hmm. of doing something that wouldn't honor his legacy and and the nephew is the hero Kurt Dr. Freed he just bided his time and bided his time and kept talking to Aunt Pat and Aunt Pat at that point it was getting really late in her life and she was not quite the same and he took her aside, which I didn't put in the film, and said, do you really want to leave your daughters with this problem? And then mm. that, a week later, she sent him that note, and he was ready to rock. He went to Lou Sharp right away at, mm -hmm. the, at, at, at the Denver Art Museum. They got mayor, then mayor, now governor, soon to be senator, John Hickenlooper, right. and he was amazing. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I mean, who would put that museum in Denver? You know, and you, but, but you look at the scroll that we have in the film of all the cities that came to her mm -hmm. and, and said, how about here? Why do you think that finally at the end that, that she, she acquiesced? I think she felt like she was running out of time, uh -huh. personally. Are you, are you describing what's so happening where you really have to act in competition with Denver? And then she finally said, oh, you're going to do it. Yes, kind of like that moment where you decide you're going to get married as a bachelor <laughs> and it intersects with the girl you're dating at that point. Yeah, it's kind of like that. <laughs> so. Those are all the places she said no to. Well, Denver was on that list. I don't think that's an unfair statement. No, Denver was on that list more than once. Oh, yeah, yeah. So it wasn't mm -hmm. that, that. But that was because of Kurt, her, her, her nephew. Yeah. He would always put them. Yeah, they, they you know, several yeah. places tried yeah. several times. Yeah. Well, since we've opened it up, let's, uh, does anybody else have a, a question or a comment? You mentioned, Dennis, that um, it was years and years in the making and this kind of labor of love and stops and starts. Um, what would you say was the biggest kind of surprise to you with how much you knew about the artist going into the film and that moment of like, I never saw that coming or it lent a whole new texture to the film? I think that when I started to make the film, I was very concerned about not, not making him seem like a perfect human being but also not really, I mean, from the tapes, you can see it's pretty easy to make this guy seem like a miserable human being. <laughs> uh, but the, the family really humanized it for me, and it made me feel better about it. This, and I came away, the, the big surprise to me was, having been in the art world a really long time, I've been in the art world over 40 years, that he really did give up everything to maintain what his sense of integrity was. And I... You know, you hear that going in and then you get inside and you learn things about people. Uh-uh. This guy was straight up, hardcore. There was no way he was going to do this other than the way he did it. So much so that his wife was terrified, you know, to, to, to not yeah. deliver on that promise. Mm -hmm. And the museum does. Has anybody here been to the Denver, uh, to, to, to the Clipper Stone Museum in Denver? It's oh, yeah. gorgeous. Cool. I mean, it is an, a spectacularly beautiful building. It's a jewel box. And the paintings just shine there. And Brad did a good job. Brad did a great job. I, re I really, yeah. Who chose the The uh, board of directors. How'd they raise the money? Easily. <laughs> Denver has a real, <laughs> What's the Denver key? has a real kind of like uh, second city syndrome, you uh -huh. know, like, like the, the, you know, and they really, Governor Hickenlooper had really made culture a big part of his administration. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they just rallied behind this because they knew it was world class. And Denver doesn't really have a lot of world class cultural things. Mm -hmm. And so it, re it really came very easily. You know? And then, of course, at the end, uh, we're a little oblique about it in the film. But before Mrs. Still transferred her portion of the estate, I think he left her 200 paintings. So just before his will was about his paintings and she got her paintings, just before they transferred 200 of her paintings into the museum, they pulled four paintings, and that's what you see at Sotheby's. And boy, there was a lot of noise about that. There was a lot of, that's not what he would have wanted. Da, 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 da. Meanwhile, Dean has a $120 million endowment. And Lord knows every museum I know of, it's exactly what they need. Right. So, no, uh, that was a very smart thing to do. It makes yeah. the museum work. Mm -hmm. You know, they don't feel the pressure of, I've got to, you know, do what I have to do to get audience or things like that. So, uh, 
So I have a question about the, the daughter's final statement before the film closes, where she said that you know, she was surprised that, that, that Stad had actually given them a couple of paintings and that it had uh, it changed her life and it would change her children's life. What did she mean by that? Yeah, it's a, it's a pretty interesting question. So still left to the daughters each two abstract paintings, but it wasn't very clear in the documentation. And so they only got those paintings as the museum began to evolve. Mm -hmm. And Sandra got two paintings and sold them fairly quickly when the still market was still in the mid uh, six figures, I will mm -hmm. say. But Diane held her paintings and sold them for the 10 to $15 million mm -hmm. range. And so it secured her children's uh, future. Yeah. You know, the story of the interview with Diane is really interesting. She would not talk to me for three years. And I was pretty, you know, I kept, you got to circle back yeah. and show people what you're doing and build trust and all that. And I got to know her, her, her daughter, Stills' granddaughter, very well, who's a lovely person. But, you know, her life and her grandfather's life are completely different. She's, she's a hockey mom. All her kids play <laughs> hockey, you know, and they, they live in a nice little suburban house. And, mm -hmm. But we, we became close. She came to London and we hung out. And three years into the project, she called me and said, my mom will talk to you now. I go, why? Because she wouldn't talk to me for three years. She said, I don't know, but I think there's something cathartic that she feels will happen. And I didn't mess around. I mean, she was like, I don't know, 78 or 80 years old. You know, I got my film crew. We got on the plane. We went there like three weeks later. And the interview was very interesting. You can see, she, you know, you, she's not even talking to me. She's just mm. in her head so deep, you know? So she does the interview. And about six weeks later, she has a couple of mini strokes. And she's, and she's now really not able to talk about things that way. So the moral of the story, if you're a filmmaker, if somebody says yes, you get on the plane and you go. Because it, it happens. People die all the time, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. Yeah, they do. It's, <laughs> it's very inconvenient. Yeah. It's annoying for my films when that happens. That's all I really care about. I think yeah. another miracle in like getting all of this information and to put the story of this, this amazing artist together, you know? I mean, it's, yeah. it's, 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 and it, I think there's still more to come. I mean, I think that there's still more to learn and there's, there's more to I want to make, a, I actually want to write a play. You know those, that, those plays, I, it's called Love Letters, where the two people will mm. stand up and read. You don't really have to prepare or rehearse or anything. You just, so I want to write a play. I'm talking to Dean about it. He said I could do it, in which we take these still Rothko letters Oh, you know? boy, that would and, be and so interesting. And we're just going to have two people read them back uh -huh. and forth. So I've been working on it a little bit. I don't want to make still my life's work, I mean, but, <laughs> although I have so far. But that um, actually sounds like a really yeah, really Yeah, it'd be really fun. Part. You know, it's, yeah. like, it's like in Saturday Night Live where Dan Aykroyd used to look at Jane Curtin and say, Jane, you ignorant slut. You know, that, I mean, that, that, that's how the letters read. You know, they're really tough. Brutal. Yeah. Well, listen, I want to thank both of you for being so uh, sharing and erudite about this wonderful artist. And it's a beautiful film, and it's just been a great night. So thank you so much. And thank, thank you guys you for coming. So much for being here.